Welcome to lesson 5.5, Proofs Using Reflections. So again, we've already now went through a couple lessons looking at some basic one-step proofs about congruence and then some proofs using transitivity. Now we're building off of those ideas and getting into proofs using reflections. Now you'll notice that today's notes are a bit shorter with only a couple examples to go through. We're going to focus on one or two theorems or properties that you typically will use in these proofs. But again, you'll want to make sure that as you're completing your proofs and coming up with your justifications, so what goes in this right-hand column, you want to keep in mind that your justifications can be theorems, they can be definitions, they can be properties, or they can be postulates. And then given is our other piece over here. So you're using definitions, theorems, properties, or postulates. So when you get to some of these proofs, if you're not seeing ones like a theorem or a postulate that makes sense right away in some of your recent notes, Reminder that in the back of your textbook, there is a section just on theorems and a section on the postulates as well for reference. So keep in mind as we go through these proofs as well, there is no one set fits all type directions. Every proof is slightly different than the next. But again, there are a few key steps you can keep in mind such as you always begin with some of your given information. And whatever prove statement they give you, so A, B, and C lying on circle with the center P and radius PA, that's going to be your final conclusion on the left. So you're always going to start with either your whole or part of your given, and you're always ending with your prove. Along the way, you want to get one step closer to proving the statement. So our new theorem for today that you'll be using in these reflection proofs is the perpendicular bisector theorem. And what the perpendicular bisector theorem states is if a point is on the perpendicular bisector of a segment, then it is equidistant from the endpoints of the segment. So for example here, if I knew that line M right here was the bisector or perpendicular bisector of AB. So if line M is bisecting AB at 90 degrees, then I would know point P, which is on line M, is equidistant, so the same distance from A as it is from B. So anything along a perpendicular bisector, any point on line M would be the same distance from A and B, the endpoints of the segment that it bisects. Same thing here, if line N is the perpendicular bisector of segment BC, any point on line N would be the same distance from B as it is to C. So example one asks us to write an argument to complete the proof. So write a proof basically. Given triangle ABC, M is the perpendicular bisector of AB. Line N is the perpendicular bisector of side or segment BC. And then the other given info tells us the intersection of lines M and N is at point P. That's what this notation means. So the intersection at M and N contains point P. So point P is where those two lines cross. And again, we're trying to prove that A, B, and C all lie on circle P that has a radius from P to A. So to start off the proof, they gave us all the conclusions. We're just filling in the justifications. 
So they started with stating M is the perpendicular bisector AB. That justification would be the word given because that's some of our given information. Not all of it, but some of it. Then they said PA is equal to PB. So the distance from P to A equal to the distance P to B, we know that's true because of the perpendicular bisector theorem. P is equal distant from A and B. So PA equals PB. Then they stated N is the perpendicular bisector of BC. So line N bisecting BC, meaning that PB and PC are equal. Again, by the perpendicular bisector theorem. So now we know PA equals PB and PB equals PC. So we can use that transitive property of equality to say the distance from P to A is equal to the distance from P to C because they both equal PB. So what that tells me is PA equals PB, which equals PC, meaning A, B, and C are all the same distance from point P. Anything that's equidistant from a center point would be the definition of a circle, saying A, B, and C lie on circle with a center P, and the radius would be the distance of P to A. That's all true because we know those three points are the same distance from our center, so definition of a circle. Then, example two, apologies that some of these first letters got cut off. So what they're asking us to do in example two is to prove the following. So what it's saying is that in this case, a, point A, reflected over line M was point P. Point B, reflected over line M was R. And point C, reflected over line M was Q. Then, triangle ABC is congruent to triangle PRQ. That's what they want us to prove. So, in these statements, if they give us an if-then statement... So if your proof is written as an if-then statement, what that means is a proof is written in the form if P, then Q. So P, the if part, is always the given, and Q is the prove. So what follows if is your given, what follows then is your prove. So our given would be the reflection of A is P, reflection of B is R, and reflection of C over M is Q. The proof is just that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle PRQ. And then my advice for any proof is if they don't give you a drawing, you can always create yourself a drawing to help you make sense of the situation. I'm not sure exactly what these triangles look like, but I know A reflects to Q, B to R and C, or A reflex to P, B to R, and C to Q. So I just drew a triangle and reflected it, so I had an image to go with. So again, the first conclusion is always either your whole or part of your given. In this case, it was all the given info. Then we get to step two, where it says triangle ABC reflected over M gives us triangle PRQ. In this theorem, we use quite a bit, but we haven't, I don't think, defined it separately yet. What that theorem is known as is the figure transformation theorem, saying that a reflection is a type of transformation. So if ABC is reflected over line M, that would result in a triangle PRQ, the figure transformation theorem. So I'd recommend maybe making note down here somewhere where you have some space what the figure transformation theorem states. And again, you can find that in your book. And then the last part of this would be our final conclusion that triangle ABC is congruent to triangle PRQ because in step two, we establish that this reflection is a type of transformation 
And according to our definition of congruent figures, any figure that undergoes a transformation is going to be congruent to the original. So once we've established that this was a transformation, we can then establish that those two triangles are congruent from the definition of congruent figures. If we didn't establish it was a transformation in step two, then we wouldn't be able to use the definition of congruent figures. So as you go through today's practice problems, you'll want to, again, make sure you're going step by step. Realize that sometimes if you're checking in the back of the book, they may do something like this and split the given to one and three. It would be perfectly okay to eliminate step three from this proof and just take this part and combine it with step one and then to go from there. So you could do all your proof at once or you could split it like they did here.